Welcome to On The Line, I'm Christine Williams, coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints Hour. Canadians outraged over 500 Tamil asyl asylum seekers intercepted off the BC coast. With more expected on the way, will radio host Dr. Laura Schlesinger survive repeating the N-word 10 times during an exchange with a black caller and a dying palliative care nurse fighting to fix the system? Stay tuned. And these are the issues we're presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. Ottawa in a dilemma and Canadians outraged. A Tamil migrant ship carrying nearly 500 illegals was intercepted off the BC coast. Public Safety Minister Vic Toes warns as part of a human smuggling operation fearing more shiploads are on the way. Controversial American radio host Dr. Laura Schlesinger used the N-word 10 times during an exchange with a black caller. Question being raised, will she go the way of Don Imus? And a dying Ontario palliative care nurse is not only fighting for his life with Parkinson's, he's fighting to see changes in the system. Now let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Paul McKeever is leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario, and Vernal Banton is a motivational speaker and author. And you, the viewer, are our third guest. Feel free to call in at any time with any of your your comments about any one of the subject matters we're addressing today. Now take a look at the first and it is creating outrage. Take a look on your screen. The title, Tamil migrant ship is a test, Toe says, and more boats are on the way. This poses a dilemma for Canada on many fronts. I, I gave you an idea already that you've got the ship 500 on board, but the thing is, and we're going to be discussing it more at length shortly, but off the top here, these are people that, again, they could have terrorist links. That's one concern. Another concern is this. Once a ship like that turns up here at our border, so to speak, we're obligated to look after them. Now, these 500 are going to be fingerprinted. They're going to be checked out based on their what we think of their history as Tamil Tigers, we're thinking so. This is a major concern here that they could belong to terrorist groups. But even more importantly, there are suspicions that it's really part of a larger plan, that it be, it, there's a smuggling ring involved here. And Vic to suggested for some reason that there could be two more ships on the way. Not only is this an expensive venture, but you're looking at it from the point of view of who's coming into our country and who's going to follow these people down the road? What's going to be the price tag to that? And this is what we're discussing here because according to this article, there's plenty of outrage. People saying, well, why are we doing this here in Canada? But then again, you're coming from a legal background as well. What are our options? I'm going to start with you on this one, Paul. Well, I think the major concern is that these uh, people on the boat do not seem to fit into the category of refugee. Um, my understanding is that the boats were originally heading uh, to Australia, mm -hmm. uh, but Australia having a more um, intolerant view toward, or maybe a stricter view toward uh, abuses of their immigration system, the boat uh, changed direction and came to Canada thinking we were an easier target. So I, I think that's probably one of the reasons that Vic Taves is looking at, you know, what's going on here under the surface. I think, though, that the, the concern that Canadians raise, I mean, hundreds of people come into the country all the time, quite legitimately. It's not a question of immigration, of people coming to our shores. But what raises, um, uh, I think, people's concern is not that people coming over are trouble, but that more people equals more strain on resources. Yes. And that's only an issue because we've chosen a collectivist system. And I don't think we should have, I think, but what it breeds is a hatred of anyone who puts more strain on the system. And I think, therefore, that uh, as long as we have a you know, socialized healthcare, socialized schools, socialized where everyone's paying into a taxpayer pot, uh, there, there are going to be resentments about anybody who comes and puts more strain on it. And the unfortunate thing when everyone comes in a boat is they maybe all look the same, they maybe all come from the same country, and then there's this resentment toward that people who look like that or that country. And I, I think that uh, resentment is something that we are um, guilty of, of producing because of our social systems. Hmm. Okay, Vernal, your thoughts on this? Well, well said. I think from a community and social service background, there's a lot of things that we need to understand. Um, as you, you said quite well, 
I think too often people say that they're searching for, they're coming to apply to Canada as a refugee claimant, and and they don't truly understand what that really entails because everybody seems to want to use that as a reason to want to stay in the country. But I think just before that happens is we have to analyze why are people wanting to come to Canada? I mean, there are so many options that Canada gives freely. Unlike America, when they look at the social services sector, people are getting food uh, stamps. And so everybody knows when you're going to the stores, your social background, and they know economically in your class in regards with your income set. But in Canada, people on social services, especially here in Toronto or in the Toronto area, they have the money and they're entitled to do whatever they want to do. So I think what happens is, from an immigration perspective, there's a lot of great things that people promote Canada um, from their countries and coming in here and saying, you know what, if they come to Canada, they're going to get all these free things and they're less lenient and you can file as a refugee claimant and there's more opportunities because they'll give you a place to stay, there's shelters. So I think let's look at the reasons why they're coming here and then once when they actually are applying for that status of refugee claimant, we have to understand we don't know what they're linked to. So they very well could be linked with terrorists or any other yeah. militant group. I mean, if I were living in Sri, Sri Lanka, I'd be the first guy paying to get on that boat. If I knew I could get to Canada, I mean, I, I think that uh, Canada's got its problems, of course, but compared to what they've got there... Uh, Precisely. You Precisely. Know, it, 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 it's not a question of... of uh, right or wrong, if Canada is going to let us in, then okay. Well, why not? not? So it begs the question, is Canada too easy when it comes to this? I mean, another thing was raised here, and I know that there are many departments when it comes to law, many, many types, and you are a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not asking you to be an expert in everything here, including immigration law, sure. but one thing was brought out in this article that there apparently has been questions. If these people were intercepted on the high seas, would that have made Canada obligated? Now, according to what Vic Toes is saying, yes, Canada is still obligated because once, when, if we officially end up boarding any other type of a ship, then, of course, that puts us, what he's saying, to be obliged to these people. And the concern being raised here, and that's why many Canadians are outraged, is there are two more expected to be on the way. Now, did he just pull that number out of a hat? Hardly. There must be a reason why he's warning that there are two more on the way. Yeah. Well, but care could mean, you know, escorting the boat right back to where it came from. If they think this is a criminal uh, act, that someone's engaging in cr crimes against Canadians or against the people on the boat, uh, we have a Navy. <laughs> we can, if we can intercept them, we can point. turn them back and escort them safely and humanely back to... Uh, to where the, the boat originally was uh, sent from. But, you know, there's another angle here, and that is, what about all of the people uh, currently sitting in other countries around the world, waiting for their paperwork to be processed in Canada? Jumping and saying, the queue here. Jumping the queue, and it's straightforward. I, you know, you have to keep in mind, Sri Lanka is not the Congo. I mean, Sri Lanka is a Commonwealth country. It's a democratic uh, country. It's, it's, um, it doesn't have a civil war ongoing right now. There, there have been displacements 20 years ago of Muslims out of um, the, the part of Sri Lanka that they wanted to have secede from the rest. And there were some massacres attributed to the Tamil Tigers. I don't know to what extent now that the civil war is over and there's some report of some Muslims choosing to go back into the uh, disputed territory uh, and, and finding some, you know, um, uh, resistance there, whether maybe some of the people on this boat are, are people who are Muslims who were, who were pushed out of their land 20 years ago and aren't, not, aren't being received back into their own homes, into their own communities back in Sri Lanka. So there might be some genuine political, uh, there's a history there of murders of Muslims. Oh, so, yes. so it may be very well that some of them are, are actual refugees. You'll, they'll all have to be judged one by one. But um, I just find it hard to believe And there is a threat posed, make no mistake. I mean, these are Tamils here. And, uh, and I'm not, we don't want to label all of them. Yeah. But the bottom line is, according to this article and according to how they're being processed, they're being taken to the jails to be fingerprinted. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot that's embedded in this article that is not being said overtly. And according to the McKenzie Institute, the Tamil Tigers do pose a major security threat to our country. So here we are in a dilemma, and what, is, what does Toes do? I mean, you, you can't blame the guy. This could also be a political hot potato. He's, a, he's pleading to allies to help out in this situation. Perhaps it's in the capacity that you suggested, Paul, that let's escort these people back home, and maybe that's the kind of a help that he's p appealing for with the allies. Did any of you wonder what allies are being appealed to and why? Well, I, I would think um, India, in, in, in part, my understanding is that there were places in India 
that um, the, the people could have been received. So that's what sort of suggests mm, this isn't just about um, being safe, this is about you know, a better economic zone than I'm living in. Yes. And that is not, a, of course that's why you want to leave a country, because a life is better elsewhere, but that doesn't mean that you have an excuse for jumping the queue, as it were. You got a good point. Now, jumping the queue is obviously a major factor here. And the question is, Canada is a good country, a helpful country, known to open its doors to those in need. Are we being abused? Let us know your thoughts. Let's go now to Audrey on line seven. Hi, Audrey. You're on the line. Hello? Let's go ahead, Audrey. Yes, you know what? They should not be allowed in this country. Uh, they should be allowed to come in the right way, and they should uh, not be allowed to come in here and, and upset our country, our town. They are terrorists. The country knows that. And why are they catering to those people when we have so many children here that needs attention, that are hungry, and all our, our, some of our money and my taxpayers' dollars are going to uh, support those people? I think it's wrong, and I am so upset that I really don't know what I can do. I'm really upset. Audrey, I want to thank you for calling in and expressing that viewpoint because the feel that we get here, because another article that we have before us just to read and investigate that we, um, we, we, we sent to our guests here, just as background, one is also entitled Tamil Asylum Seekers Spark Canadian Vitriol Anger. And here are some of the wordings uh, of this article, the way it starts out um, from the Toronto Star. Quote, send them back. These boat people are abusing the system, taking us for a ride. I mean, people are outraged here. But the point of the matter is Canada has its law when it comes to who we accept in. Immigration stream is very different from the refugee stream. Do we need an overhaul in our system? Do we need to be rethinking how we do things? Once again, our lines are open for you to call in. We're asking you to be patient here. We will get to you. We'll be back after the break. Don't go away. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line, continuing to talk about our first story. Once again, our lines are open to hear your thoughts. And the bottom line is, we're looking at a, a shipload of Tamils coming here as potential refugees. Well, they are refugees because they're now here and they're now getting processed, all 500 of them. Where they're going to go from being fingerprinted and tested, I have no idea, but we do know. And I'm not trying to raise anger against refugees. We have been a sympathetic country over the years. but. I do agree with our caller here that we need to be careful who we're letting in this country because the bottom line is, like everybody, we're in the middle of an economic recession, like anybody. We're doing better compared to a lot of other nations, but everybody knows our medical system is cash-strapped. When refugees come here, they get automatic medical, basically free everything. And based on our first caller here and the concerns that were expressed, what does Canada do based on what our laws are on people showing up at our front door? What are we to do? Well, I, I think there's two things. One, of course, you, you have to be careful about who comes in, although the general rule should be anybody who wants to come can. That's how it has been. Yeah, and, and that's fine with me. Um, to my mind, it's not. I don't care what you look like, but the one thing that does concern me about policy is we don't care enough about what people think like. And so, for example, during, during uh, the, the Cold War, I wouldn't want KGB agents from Russia to be given voting rights in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, if we're currently at, at war with theocracy in the Middle East, I think that if you're sympathetic, you haven't committed a crime necessarily, but if you say, oh no, I, I, I think that democracy is evil, well, I don't think that that's a candidate for Canadian citizenship. That's mm -hmm. my own view. But apart from that, the system that's broken is not so much the immigration system, but as I was saying earlier, the healthcare system. We cannot make no system in which everyone pays in and then we ration out healthcare. Uh, a can la can last, uh, B can never provide quality health care, or C. You're talking about feasibility here, it's, plain and simple. It's an economic death. I mean, I think it's also morally wrong to take money from people who aren't getting paid or aren't get, aren't receiving the services that they're paying for. But even as a matter of economics, it's not sustainable. And as the population of people that come in who aren't putting money into the system increases, there's going to be both pressure on this on the system to make smaller rations for everyone, and there's going to be huge racist resentment. Huge, uh, huge. huge. Uh, it's, it's wrong, and I think we've got to rethink socialized health care. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's always been the case. I think for white back from when Pierre Elliott Trudeau 
brought all these um, newcomers or immigrants to this country. I think um, it was trying to open up a floodgate of increasing population. So, I mean, with every good, there's also a bad. And I think yes. what happens is in this case, they're trying to look about increasing potentially um, candidates to come into the country. The only problem is what are they bringing into the country? But that, you know, to me, that is the huge factor here. That is a huge factor. It's no secret that Canada is dependent on immigration. But yeah. immigration is one thing. Hard-working people coming into the country is another. And are we scrutinizing enough as to what we accept, who we accept in this country? Let's go now to Ali on line six. Hi, Ali. You're on the line. Well, hello. Hi, Ali. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think uh, both you, well, all three of you have said exactly what I wanted to say. And um, first of all, I'm, par I'm uh, a child of uh, immigrants, so my parents came, and uh, trust me, they... They didn't come at a time that was um, terribly popular to be from the country where they were, but there were also rules. What really upsets me is that we are accepting the, and they're not immigrants. They just completely interloped, uh, interloped right there and just jumped queue, as you said, and now they're taking our resources without having contributed. We don't know if they will be contributing at all or not, and uh, especially at this time, when it's a very uncertain economic times, hey, you know what? There are only so many people contributing to this, these, these social networks and, and social programs. Um, I, it gets me a little concerned, and, and especially it will be setting precedent for, as you said, are there two, are there three, are there four? I don't know how many more boats are there that could possibly be coming in. And then um, can Canada say, well, no, we won't accept you? Ellie, you got a great point there. And for the record, we're glad you called in. It doesn't matter if you guys calling in agree with us. It doesn't matter if you disagree with us. It's very important to hear your point of view because we also consider you a guest, an important part to our show. You bring up some great points, Ellie, because the bottom line is we really don't know how many ships could be coming into this country. Another thing is, no matter what country you're from, you're going to be keeping a close eye open on what Canada does here to see if it may be lucrative for you to pull this same stunt. And to me, that is a major concern as well. Where does Canada draw the line here? Because there doesn't seem to be a system in place to be able to draw the line. Yeah, I think you draw the line at making sure. I mean, the unfortunate thing when so many people come, on, uh, come over all at once is that um, you can't just say across the board, nobody on there is a refugee. And so you end up having to go through a quite laborious process of, in this case, it's going to be potentially thousands of people will have to be, have their cases reviewed one by one. And certainly if there are, are people there who are refugees, maybe they do get to uh, uh, jump the queue in that sense because if they go back, they're going to be murdered and et cetera. But I think it's highly doubtful that, you know, boatloads, coordinated boatloads of people, hundreds of people, manage to get onto a boat and come without the state knowing somehow without being mowed down by the potential murderers or abusers. I, I, I find it hard to believe that this is a boat of refugees rather than just a, a boat of people who choose for economic or other re, maybe religious freedom reasons to, to go to, to Canada instead of staying where they are. Yes, yes. I go think ahead. we'd have to actually redefine what a refugee claimant should be. The criteria has now, the game has changed, so they have to reevaluate what that uh, means. That's a great point. That seems to be the only way to be able to tackle because this. Too many people and the other are question is, that, and this is, this is where the question gets really tough here, and it becomes a political hotball. It, we have the potential of looking cold in the process, but here's the fact here. Canada has always been a kind country, and, and I love Canada. From that point of view, it's fantastic. But we are strained economically. Our medical resources are, are thinning. When you look at the global needs, and I'm talking in, every, in, in a lot of countries here, most countries, I would say, globally, when you look at what's going on in, in all across the continent of Africa, when you look at the continent of Asia, when you look at the world's poor across the board, you look at the oppression, the killings, is there a point where we, we start to say, well, there's only so much? that we could accommodate. I'm not offering an answer here because frankly, I don't know where that line would be. But based on that point alone, now with the Tamils, we have an added problem with the problem of terrorism. But even based on the refugee issue, do we need to draw lines here? I don't think so. I think the maximum population is whatever the land will sustain. Um, the only question to my mind is making sure that in the process we maintain a democratic Canada uh, and that the people who come are, like every other immigrant in Canada's history, are prepared to uh, pay for what it is and earn what it is 
that they consume. And but you also believe, though, that people coming into this country, even as refugees, shouldn't be getting any freebies whatsoever. I think, yeah, I think that's, uh, well, refugees is a slightly different matter. If you're, if you're crawling up on the beach because someone's about to murder you, that's a, that's a matter of compassion. It's a humanitarian issue. Yeah, but, but as far as immigration goes, mm -hmm. if you're hoping to come here and not work, I say you're not welcome. Uh, that, that's not what you're here for. Mm -hmm. you're, every, every Canadian should be a working, producing, self-sustaining person and not expect anybody to, you know, what, I, I arrive on your shores in England and now you're going to pick up the tab for me? Why? I, I'm a Canadian, I'm able-bodied, I get to work, mm -hmm. you know? You had something you were going to say there, Brian. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess the whole, um, I think, misunderstanding is that once when you have um, people that, for example, if you even come like on a visa, um, there's people that we're not really addressing in this topic, but I think it's relevant. People stay past their time period, and those same people who stay past, regardless of their culture, can actually be an imposition on government funding as well. And I think what happens is, is, is that any different than someone who's just coming across the, you know, the kind of being smuggled in. Because if someone's staying past their time period and they become a burden, is there any difference in someone that outright is comes in? Is if you think about it. I know in principle maybe not, but in effect, maybe there is. And here's the difference. If you're here on a visa, then that, there's already been some pre-screening. You're probably not a terrorist and et cetera. So in that sense, I'm not concerned. If, if you're here illegally and you've, been, you've had that pre-screening, in all likelihood, you're not going to start um, using social services that would identify you as still being in the country. And if that's the case, then effectively you're a private sector, personally responsible, self-sustaining member of society, and I welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly I think it's, it's not fair to the people in waiting in line, but if you're not using um, any, if you're not relying upon Canadians to support you, you're self-supporting and you're doing our, 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 sorry, agricultural work or construction, <laughs> great. Vernal, you got sorry. something to say, big time there. Yeah, but the problem is, is that once you go through the screening process and you're here legally, then how do we know what people end up doing to sustain a livelihood? It could actually then be other illegal activities. Rather, it is further trafficking or it could be doing just other illegal acts to sustain their livelihood. Because it's one thing to present something and as pre-screening for your immigration status to qualify you as being someone who has the money, it's the next thing for you actually to be here and actually sustain yourself. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, it's yeah, not really I mean, addressed in what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that the law should be changed so that you can stay here illegally after you have a visa, but I'm just saying, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of what, what I'm upset about, that's not the person I'm concerned about. The person I'm concerned about is the person who intentionally says... The takers. The yeah, takers. I'm, 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 a, I'm a consumer, not a giver, and uh, that's why I'm going to Canada. I say, no, stay where you are. <laughs> Let's go down to Yasmin on line six. Hello, Yasmin, you're on the line. Uh, hi, Christine. Uh, I hope, I just switched on the TV. I hope this is about this boat coming in. With yes, it my, is. You've got okay. it. Okay. I am a Tamil, and we came as immigrants years ago, so I do... Um, I, I, I do know what the, the whole thing is about. So I belong to the same race. I'm not of the opposite race. But uh, we are totally against these people coming in. How come they jump into a boat like this, no matter what the conditions are there? There are so many countries around the world who, ha who have warfare, and there are refugee camps, and et cetera, et cetera. But they don't take it for granted and jump into a boat or into a plane and come in <laughs> because they know that Canada will uh, do whatever. The other point is, how do we know that they will contribute to society? Because we know personally so many here, they do not go out to work. They sit at home, and they are getting this welfare, whatever it's called, and they live a comfortable life. And all of us, we run to work, we sweat it out, and that's what it's supposed to be. Yasmin, so, I'm glad you called in. So glad you called in. First of all, you are... The ta of the Tamil race, you make something very clear that obviously you are a hard-working Canadian, and it's people like you that you need to keep on speaking up. We, we talked about this early in the program. If you just tuned in, you would have missed it, that there was a concern raised that when you see people like this coming aboard and, and, and committing these types of acts, belonging to some smuggling ring, taking advantage of a country, it ends up breeding racism, all kinds of forms of racism. When people like you speak up against that injustice, it allows other Canadians to know that, you know what, not all Tamils are the same. I applaud you for that. Thank you. Let's go now to Kathy on line eight. Hi, Kathy. You're on the line. Hi, Christine. You know about refugees. I could call the Hungarians who came here from refugee camp refugees because in 1956, 
Canada said, okay, we are going to, let's say, accept 2,000 Hungarians from the refugee camp. Kathy, I'll tell you. Oh, Kathy, are you there? Yes, guys. No. Wait, did no, I yeah. hear correctly? Kathy, I want to thank you for your call. Morning. I'm going to ask you to try to call in. What I'm going to do now, though, is that I'm going to go for a break. I'm asking you to be patient on the phone lines. As soon after the break, we're going to get straight back to you, so don't go away.